Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Mr. Raider here for AP World History Review. Uh, we're looking at our next live lecture, looking at the time period 1750 to 1900 CE. We have the AP exam in 2020 coming up in exactly 10 days, so make sure that you watch the other lectures that I put together and make sure you look at the uh, College Board's uh, YouTube channel on the AP exam. They already have two practice exams up and ready to go. We're gonna look at one of them today. Okay, so this lecture is going to cover uh, units five and unit six. So it's looking at revolutions and consequences of industrialization, again, from the period 1750 to 1900. And it is the last two major components that are going to be covered on the 2020 exam. So what I want to start off with is actually the DBQ that was posted a day or two ago on the College Board's YouTube channel. And what you're looking at here is a modified DBQ based on five documents that were edited for the purpose of this exam. And notice the question is the same that we've been looking at all year. They always start with a general prompt, evaluate the extent to which X, right? So in this case, it says evaluate the extent to which indigenous peoples reactions to state expansion differed from the period 1750 to 1900. So again, uh, one of the things I want you all to kind of keep in mind is when you're looking at this particular question, we want to consider specifically one, what was the reaction that indigenous people had to state expansion? So two, who are these indigenous people and which states are we talking about? So let's look at the time period, 1750 to 1900. So one of the things you should be aware of is that the rise of industrialization allowed the Western European countries to enter into the game of imperialism and to really take the lead in solidifying their own states through their empires, including the British Empire, which had that very famous moniker that the, uh, the sun never set on the British Empire because their empire covered all of the major time zones on the planet. So. In terms of indigenous people, okay, so now we're really looking at the roles of people in South Asia, looking at Great Britain's colony in India. We're looking at the role of South Africans, uh, thinking about the conflicts between the British, the Dutch, the Boers, the Zulu people, uh, so on and so forth. We're going to be looking at Southeast Asia. We're going to be looking at uh, places like East Asia as well, considering what is happening uh, in that particular region of the world. So when you write your thesis statement, you want to be very, very clear that you're responding to the prompt with a defensible thesis that has a line of reasoning. So for example, uh, one could argue that the indigenous people um, resisted, right? We could look at terms of how there was resistance that was taking place. Uh, for example, in uh, South Africa, we can kind of contrast that to um, accommodation movements. So thinking about what happened when the United States went into Japan during the Meiji Restoration, it was more of assimilating the American technology into the Japanese state, which allowed them to then in turn become imperialist with their wars against uh, Korea and also uh, China and Russia uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. But I digress. What I wanna focus on here is considering uh, the points that you can get on these AP exams. So the rubric's a little different this year. If you look at the College Board YouTube video, they explain it a little bit more, a little better, honestly. They're going to spend a lot more time. Their videos are about an hour in length. And they include the chief reader who essentially organizes the distributed scores when they grade your exams. I'm doing a shortened version because we're going to be looking mostly at content review today. However, notice you get a point for thesis. You can get a point for including historical context. Remember, it's got to be relevant to the prompt. So, you, you know, talking about the scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 can only be relevant if you then tie it into how uh, this led to indigenous resistance amongst uh, specific groups in West Africa or South Africa or East Africa, and kind of considering uh, how the partition of the continent led to state expansion during that time. Okay. Uh, supporting an argument and response using at least four documents. And remember, they give you five. You should use all five in case you make a mistake on one of them, but they're only requiring four to get that point. Uh, using at least two additional pieces of his historical evidence beyond that found in the documents. So this is to be in them being very, very specific. So they're looking for two examples of EBD, evidence beyond the document to get those points. Uh, and then for at least two documents, Explain how or why the documents point of view, 
purpose, historical situation, or audience is relevant. So remember, this is sourcing the document. This is understanding the underlying biases within the document. So for example, how might a person's position in society influence how he or she thinks about a particular issue or initiative, policy, or program that the state is promulgating? Remember, you want to use your HIPPO analysis, historical context, the intended audience, the purpose of the document, the point of view of the person creating the document, and your outside information. What information can you bring to the document about a particular time period, a state, a person, an event, so on and so forth. So you'll notice the documents are pretty short on this AP exam. The reason why they're relatively short is you're going to only have about 45 minutes to write this essay, okay, unless you have extended time. So you want to be able to go through the documents quickly, make quick notations, and make sure that you practice with the AP demo before you take the AP exam on May 21st. Get used to the framework so that you'll be confident when you take the AP exam. So let's look at the first document and let's just spend two minutes doing basic hippo analysis. The source is from Prempeh the first. He's an Asante leader, so okay, we're in West Africa. Uh, a response to a British officer protector of status, West Africa, 1891. Uh, quote, the suggestion that Asante in its present state should come and enjoy the protection of Her Majesty, the Queen of England and Empress of India, is a matter of very serious consideration. I am pleased to announce that we have arrived at the conclusion that my kingdom of Asante will never commit itself to any such policy. Asante must remain as of old and at the same time friendly with all white men. Okay, so let's think, let's think about this a little bit. So let's think first about the perspective of the, of the writer. Prempe is the Asante leader. So this is somebody who's leading their own empire, their own kingdom. The Asante empire had been around for centuries, okay, uh, in West Africa. They're a very powerful kingdom. They had been involved with the transatlantic slave trade. They're not weak. They're, the, they're in the interior. They have a very proud tradition. So that may speak to why they would resist or refuse to commit itself to be uh, subject, subjects. Uh, of the British crown, right? You know the British, they have their Gatling guns, their cannons, their industrialized uh, tools of warfare. We have a proud leader who's going to resist, right? So that might tell us a little bit about their point of view. Now, what's the purpose? Well, they're responding to a British offer of protectorate status. So basically, we think about the purpose of the document is to inform the British Admiralty, the British High Command, that they're not going to play along. They're not going to acquiesce to the British demands. In terms of outside information, we could bring in the role of the Asante kingdom in world history. Uh, when we think of the historical context, we're looking at, okay, 1891, so this is six years after the Berlin Conference. We can kind of think about the British are in agreement with the French to split up different parts of Africa, and they're going to eventually be transitioning to military-based systems to do so. So if we were writing this document, we could say, Okay, so Prempe, as an leader of the Asante Kingdom, would be resistant to acquiescing to the British crown because he has a pride, a prideful nature and does not want to give up his own leadership command. Uh, likewise, the document's purpose shows that there's going to be conflict between the British and the Asante people and that there's going to be a clear sense of resistance occurring at the time. Okay. And we look at document number two. This is the Tong Hawk Proclamation of Soldiers and Civilians. It does get cut off, but again, notice the year. So the Japanese have had their Meiji Restoration. The Tokugawa Shogunate is no more, and they have industrialized using Western uh, technological means. Okay. So what I included here are just a list of LEQ prompts that I have seen over the years. Uh, when this exam was uh, based on uh, past historical events dating back to ancient times to the present. And I'm just going to leave the slide up for a moment if you want to look at some of these prompts and kind of consider how you might go about writing a response to them. This really allows you to bring in outside information for this particular moment in world history. Okay, so thinking about this time period, we're going to dive now into the lecture. This next part will probably last anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. I'll try to keep it on the shorter end. But in terms of some of the big picture themes, we're looking at the Atlantic Revolution. So we're going to be looking at the revolutions uh, first in the United States, 1776, 
Then in France, 1787, uh, 80, uh, 1792 to 1804, thereabouts, uh, we're going to be looking at Latin American independence movements. So again, thinking from like 1805 in Mexico to 1825 when Interbride gives uh, Mexico its independence, right? We're going to be looking at the campaigns of um, Bolivar and uh, San Martin and so on and so forth. We're going to be looking at industrialization and the connection between industrialization and imperialism. Like that's what Unit 6 is all about, consequences of industrialization and what that actually means in terms of the global planet framework. Uh, dominance of the West is a major theme. Reactions to imperialism, that's exactly what that DBQ prompt uh, is asking. Uh, global trade as a sense of continuity building on the existing trade networks that had existed at the time, but also uh, changes, thinking about the role of the British Navy and the role of uh, British flat, uh, the British uh, trade ships in facilitating a global commerce in giving a common language. So for example, when we look at the previous lectures uh, videos, I explained to you the role of cross-cultural interactions and particularly looking at the role of Arabic as a language of unity under Islam as a religion. In this case, it's looking at the commercial views of capitalism and English as an international language for trade. New economic systems and then dem demographic change. So looking at migration patterns, so understanding why do we have migrants going from India to South America, right, and Suriname? Why do we see large numbers of European immigrants coming over to the United States? Why do we see migration happening from uh, India to South Africa, among many other examples? Okay, so the first example is the French Revolution. Now, do you need to know every single detail for the EP World History exam? No, not really, but I did include a lot of details here for you to be aware of. I'm going to go over just a couple of the bullet points I think are useful, and then the other details, uh, feel free to make notes of them as you wish. So it really is taking place over a 10-year period. It begins 1789. It actually lasts until... Uh, 1800 thereabouts when Napoleon is crowned the emperor and technically it there's not a restoration of the crown until 1815 after the battle of Waterloo and the, and the demise of the French empire but big picture there's a resentment towards royal power and the resentment is really there because under the French tax system at the time about 97 percent or so of the population was being taxed they made up the third estate uh, it was a range of occupations but they didn't have much of the wealth the concentrated wealth was in the 3%, 2% uh, for the nobility and 1% for the clergy. And that, as far as being the second and first estate, they paid no taxes. And that's a big problem in terms of understanding uh, inequities in French society. But the big thing that's going to actually lead them to revolution is a famine in uh, crop production. 1787, 1788, 1789. There's food scarcity that turns to bread riots. And if people can't put food on the table and they become desperate, that's when real revolutions begin to develop if the government does not intervene to help people. So if there's support systems uh, in place to help people, very similar to what we're seeing in many states and countries during the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, that level of desperation doesn't necessarily come to the fore as it did in the late 1700s when there were no bread lines, no pantry lines, no assistance whatsoever to the people. So what happens? Well, the middle class members of the third estate uh, formulate a national assembly after getting locked out of these states general. So you have a lot of bureaucratic lawyers who then create a, uh, a template for what became the French constitution, a declaration of the rights of man and the citizen. Uh, by 1789, July 14, they still celebrate it every year in France, Bastille Day. Uh, the prison of Bastille is taken by the rebellion, it's destroyed. Uh, in its place, there is a monument uh, in, in Paris in Paris today. So the Haitian Revolution is another story in of itself. We did spend at least a lesson. We spent a couple of lessons, maybe like three or four, looking at it in class this year. But it's really understanding the roles of Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines in facilitating the political ideology of the revolution, thinking about how uh, yellow fever as a mosquito-borne disease decimated the French army and allowed, uh, in many ways, the Haitians to emerge victorious, and really thinking about it in terms of its real historical significance, which is the fact that this was the very first ever successful slave rebellion in world history in terms of thinking about the Atlantic um, sphere. 
And because of the Haitian Revolution, it's the very first time where we actually see a radical change in the structure of a state. Now, the Americans had their revolution, the French had their revolution. The Americans basically went from a constitutional monarchy to an oligarchy under the guise of democracy, but really under the control of a very select few who actually could legislate, actually control, actually vote. Uh, just think about like the racial and the property requirements in the United States that limited and disenfranchised the vast majority of people. Haiti's a different story, and that's important to really understand. So it also leads hope for the abolition movement throughout North America. It culminates in the Civil War of the United States, 1861 to 65, and the 13th Amendment, so on and so forth. And uh, thinking about uh, the banning of the slave trade, it's really going to be the British Empire that actually facilitates the end of slavery, the slave trade, much more so than the United States. Okay, Latin American independence movement. So we're looking at essentially a couple of different key things, but just like with any major revolution with causality, inequality is going to be a primary motivating factor. Understanding uh, the hierarchy with the peninsulares and the Creoles. Creoles, think of it like the French Revolution. This was the third estate. This was the middle class. This were the lawyers. Uh, Creoles were basically Spaniards, Europeans, who did not like that they were not being given the same privileges as the peninsulares. Um, Creoles are able to gather the support of mestizos and mulattoes, which are mixed race individuals, and they're able to facilitate different independence movements in places like Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Guiana, uh, Guiana, Suriname. And they try to create a state like in the United States, they call it Grand Colombia, it was Bolivar's dream. It, it fails, it, it doesn't work. So we see independent countries being formed and thinking about essentially how they use enlightenment ideas to spur their own revolutions. Okay, so thinking about revolutions in terms of just big picture, all re revolutions in many cases, at this time, 1750 to 1900, are a consequence of peasant unrest and uh, really disruptions in the supply chains, which make desperate uh, times even much worse. Uh, industrialization, economic hardship, nationalism is going to begin to play a major role, really thinking about uh, nationalism in response or in resistance to the Napoleonic uh, campaigns of expansion. This is where we begin to see the foundations of the German state. Uh, and the foundations of the, the Italian state. I mean, Germany doesn't get its, uh, they don't unify really entirely until 1871 under Prussia. The Italians do it in 1860, the Risorgimento under Piedmont, and they eventually become their own state as well. Uh, the media in terms of pamphlets makes a major role advocating change, newspaper reports, so on and so forth. Some additional motivations in terms of thinking about these revolutions, the role of the European Enlightenment, thinking about uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the idea of the general uh, will, uh, John Locke, Baron de Montesquieu and separation of powers, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, and, is, and there's many, many more. Uh, David Hume, uh, Emmanuel Kant, uh, Voltaire. I mean, I can go, I can go on and on. Some things to kind of consider, commercialization is going to contribute to merchants challenging the idea that the aristocrats should hold the highest power and that power should really be controlled through economics. Okay. So this graphic organizer compares the causes and the motivations of each of these major revolutions. So I'm going to leave the slide up just for a few moments. You could always pause and go back if you want to spend more time reading it. Uh, it just does a recap of the things that I discussed verbally. Okay. So thinking about the Industrial Revolutions, what are some of the key trends and patterns that are occurring at the time? Well, we're going to begin to see, among other things, change in social structure. It's really going to be facilitated with the desire to essentially expand the textile industry. Uh, by the early 18th century, the primitive steam engine, 1712, the new common steam engine comes into play. And basically the whole point of that steam engine was to draw water out of coal mines so that industries could use coal to power uh, furnaces within these companies. Steam engines develop and advance throughout the 18th century. The one that we're more familiar with is the James Watt steam engine, I believe 1760 or 1761. 
And that uh, uh, builds on the work of Newcomb and others and essentially burns coal to power pulleys to essentially facilitate a combustion engine. Now, all the, the inner workings of it, I don't know off the top of my head, but basically it, it is used to burn coal to help the power the factories. All right. Uh, another thing to consider during the time is there's a major shift from agrarian societies to urbanized city centers. So prior to the 20th century, I think the numbers was about 90% of the world's population lived in the rural society, agricultural based, and 10% lived in cities. But the middle decades of the 20th century, it more or less reverses about 90% of the world global population in cities and about 10% agriculture. And that's really a direct consequence of the Industrial Revolution. So some things to consider, we have the capitalist upper class, uh, we see a new middle class emerging, and we see a much, much uh, growing working class population. We see the rise of labor movements, so we're beginning to eventually see the transition from the medieval guilds to labor unions, first skilled labor unions, and then eventually unskilled labor unions, the idea of organizing and doing collective bargaining to advance the rights and roles of workers. New economic structures and then government reforms as needed. And you can see some examples here. And thinking about what role the government should play in our day-to-day -day society, uh, really everything that we take for granted today, the uh, clean water supply, uh, having uh, the uh, sewage systems of the United States, thinking about the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, the hospitals, the schools, uh, police force, the fire department, essentially anything that you would see in a city or a state budget. All right, imperialism, moving on. So, well, why? Well, in order to facilitate a booming economy, you're going to need vast supplies of need rubber. You want to build tires? You're going to need rubber. You want to build uh, up-to-date buildings and um, roadways? Okay, you're going to need asphalt. You're going to need steel. You're going to need iron. You're going to need copper. Uh, you're going to need palladium. You're going to need a lot of things. And it's really going to be the industrialization that is going to fuel the rise of industrialized militaries. Industrialized militaries lead to expansion. They want to look for new markets. And if a, uh, a government can use its military to force other countries to open up their economies and trade with them, well, why not? You know, it's taking advantage of the theory of competitive advantage in economics, which is the idea that if your country is very successful producing good A, instead of trying to produce good B, you're just going to trade for good B. Uh, a couple of consequences. We will see the rise of social Darwinism racial hierarchies, uh, so on and so forth. And as you can see here, kind of thinking of the rise of jingoism. All right, so this slide really thinks about the effects of imperialism on the colonies, and it kind of gives you a simple breakdown as a T-chart, positive, negative. This looks at the role of what was happening in India with notably the British Empire, and this is thinking about what was happening in Africa. So I'll leave that slide up for a moment for you to read. Okay, let's move on. So the question here is, okay, well, how did other civilizations react to imperialism? It's actually basically the question that led you to you. What we started off with was uh, really assessing. So I'm just going to read the three, uh, three or four bullet points. The colonized world was there to provide the West with raw materials, labors, and markets for the as people resented being colonized and viewed as inferiors, they organized a series of rebellions. Only Latin America will actually throw out the West, but they will still play a, a role in their economic role. And Russia and Japan will keep the West out of their civilizations only by imitating the West. So this is thinking about uh, Peter uh, of uh, St. Petersburg. The name kind of comes into there, thinking about the role of Westernization. In Japan, thinking about the role of the Meiji Restoration. Oh, speaking of Meiji, uh, Meiji Japan. So just some uh, details to kind of keep in mind. Big picture, uh, under the Meiji Restoration, the emperor has more power. 
Uh, the Japanese professionalize their army. They bring in Western technology, Western weapons. So uh, we see the interaction of Matthew Perry, 1853, opening up the port of Edo, modern day Tokyo, and how the Japanese are able to essentially balance their traditional culture with uh, modernization. As you'll see, they begin to imperialize Korea and China as well, because just like the West, you need new markets, you need resources. Uh, it'll culminate really in the 1930s with Japan after the United States imposed an oil embargo, creating a prosperity sphere in East Asia to really bolster their oil supplies, which they need to power their internal combustion engines, ice engines, automobiles, tanks, planes, things of that nature, uh, ships, ironclad, etc., etc. So, China. Okay. So, a couple of things to kind of keep in mind. They start the unit as one of the more powerful empires, then they end the unit essentially being taken over by a European alliance after the Boxer Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion actually has a much larger impact on Chinese society, but they're both included in this slide and some additional details to kind of keep in mind. Okay, so thinking about the Ottoman Empire, we, we talked about this a little bit in the last slide. By the 20th century, they really are in decline. They do try to industrialize and reform with the Tanzimat reforms. As the slide says, it's a little too little too late. Um, the Egyptians eventually fall into the sway of the British Empire. Uh, they, in many ways, gain their own independence from the Ottoman Empire. And Persia becomes independent as well although they're nominally influenced by Russia and Great Britain. Okay, Sub-Saharan Africa, we kind of already talked about this, so I'm just going to leave the slide up for a moment, and by all means, you can pause and you can rewind so that you can see the notes and read through them on your own. A couple of things to keep in mind, considering understanding the role of the Zulu people in resistance is important, and the Boer War, how the British supplant the Dutch in terms of creating a South African state controlled by the British Empire. Some demographic and environmental trade changes. You'll notice that really up until the Industrial Revolution, population growth is, is pretty static. By 1 AD, thinking about like essentially the height of the Roman Empire, 200 million people on the planet. By 1650, 500 million people on the planet. So, okay, so a little more than a doubling. Great. But again, notice the time period, 1600 years. Within another 200 years, population doubles again. By 1930, doubles again. So now at 80 years. 1975, 4 billion, doubles again. 45 years, right? Uh, that's important in terms of understanding the exponential growth and thinking about some environmental consequences, which we'll talk more about in the next lecture when we look at the 20th and 21st centuries, thinking about uh, units uh, 8 and nine. Okay, so other things to kind of consider, just understanding this role of revolutions uh, in terms of the consequences and in terms of how it affected uh, women both before and after. So some very clear changes in terms of like work expectations, family life, etc. And by the way, the reference here says not until Unit 5, what, they're, what we're really referring to here, this is really what's happening in the 20th century, thinking about essentially what becomes on the new AP exam, AP World Modern, uh, Unit 7, uh, Global Conflicts in the 20th Century, Unit 8, the Cold War and Decolonization, and Unit 9, Globalization. It uh, would have been Unit 5 in the old AP exam, because Unit 5 really correlated to the 20th century. And this slide, again, looks at some of the prompts from 1750 to 1900. So we're going to end it here. I hope you all learned a little bit more about this time period and are able to use this information for both uh, the context point when you do your AP exam, if you get a uh, question on this prompt, or for EBD in terms of evidence beyond the documents and in the classes that see this video, 2021, 2022, 2023, et cetera, uh, really the goal will be to kind of consider how this content can help boost your responses on the LAQ, SAQ, multiple choice, and the DBQ. All right, everybody, I hope you all have a great day. Take care, and I'll join you for our next live session where we'll look at a DBQ from College Board.